Hi, nice to meet you all. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I know that you already have a lot of information coming to you, so I'll try to make this as simple and easy as possible. Um, my name is uh, Paul-Marie Carfontaine. Uh, Paul-Marie Carfontaine, I'm French. Uh, I'm Dadaiku's EI yeah, governance consultant for Americas, um, and I'm based as uh, Los Angeles. Uh, I'm really, really excited to be here with you today. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about one of my favorite topic and also one of the topic that is on top uh, on the priority list for data executive and analytics leaders, and that is the governance of analytics and AI, right? Both of them are related and both important. Um, so um, why is it important? Uh, simply because there are reputational risk, there are operational risk, there are business risk that makes them so important, right? And we're not talking about a Terminator headline, we're talking about a headline that says, this project didn't work as planned, and now people are scared, they're angry, and we're talking about it. So talking more about it is important to make sure everybody is successful. The big question behind this is how to control at scale with agility, right? So let's dive into this topic altogether. Um, and as your guys are buckling up, let's dive in the agenda. So um, governance is usually a pretty misunderstood topic. Uh, so I'm gonna start with explaining why governance is important uh, and why it matters with concrete example coming from the field. We've been talking to so many clients and I'm excited to share it with you. Something I'm gonna be sharing with you today and I think it's the most important thing is finding the right approach, right? Trying to understand how, what is your current position to know where you should go tomorrow. Um, and then we'll dive into the product. Um, some of you may have heard about Govern. I'll be doing a 360 of the product features, and I'll also be unveiling some of the feature we'll have uh, in V11, so stay tuned. And then we'll wrap it up and talk about how to take this discussion forward, um, and I'm excited. Woo! Um, so let's get started. Um, why are we talking about AI scaling? Why does that even matter? Why am I here today? Um, simply because Companies like you all have been finding some kind of value in AI and are trying to bring it and scale it, right? You have found some better customer experience. You have found some better productivity for employees. You have found some better innovation. And it sounds like this promised land, this El Dorado, and now you want to make it bigger. Makes sense, right? But as with every El Dorado, there's also some, it's not as easy as it looks, right? And I think this is a really cool um, survey that came out from O'Reilly. Um, the biggest issue with scaling is that it's not efficient, right? As you're trying to make things bigger, you're recruiting more people, you have more tools, you have more processes, and it's costly, right? It's costly especially because you're not yet able to showcase value. Right? You have this huge list of models and projects, and now you're trying to do some reporting, and it's not as easy as you thought it would be. Something that is also important, and that is usually, especially in the US, I think, not as thought as important, is regulation. In Europe, this is kind of the key topic, and it might become the top topic in the coming years, is regulators thinking about how to regulate models and projects, and uh, it's important to start thinking about it now. Um, okay, this is great. We have this tension. We're thinking about speed at scale. We're thinking about controls, but it's a little theoretical now. So let's look at what is happening on the field. We've been talking to more than 100 customers. A lot of you are here today, and I want to thank you again for all the insight you've provided us. Um, the first issue I want to tell you about is the lack of oversight. It's kind of the foundational issue when you think about governance is I don't really know where my models are. I don't know who built them. Uh, this is not working as it's supposed to be. Um, the, second the second issue that we see with all clients is that, okay, now I have a list of all my models, all my projects, but I still don't know, I still don't have this list of agreed upon metrics that I can use to say this is right or this is wrong, right? I might have a data drift, I have my model drift, but does that speak to the people I'm reporting to? Or does that speak to the people who are supposed to collect and use those metrics, right? So uh, this is a big issue. 
The second issue, which I think is the most operational, it is, it is that I have the list, I have the standards, but everything is manual. I'm still validating my models through email. I'm putting a couple of things in Excel. It's just wasting too much time, and it's not, it's not, it's not working. Um, and the fourth issue is low traceability. Nothing is documented as it should be documented. We don't even have standards for documentation. And if today I had an internal auditor or an external auditor asking me about a model, I might not be able to do it, right? So when you think about the upcoming regulation, it's important to think about this today. Um, I would love to make this as interactive as possible. Can I have a show of hand about the issue that resonates the most to you? Can I have a show of hand for the lack of oversight? For who today lack of oversight is? Okay, awesome, awesome. What about no standards? If you can raise, okay. Okay, no standards, I see you. Time intensive. Okay, okay, awesome. And low traceability? Okay, great. Diversity, I love it. Um, so, now you know we have this tension, you see you have concrete problems on the field, uh, but not everybody is equal, right? So we have different governance maturities, and I think it's important to see this from the start. The story that I have for you today is not the sexist story, it's about building a house when you think about governance. So the first one is you're building the grounds, right? You have something to work with, but it's not, uh, it needs a little bit of help, right? So um, a lot of the clients that I talk to, I've been thinking about governance for a while, but when it comes to governance of models, governor projects, uh, they don't really know how to get started, right? So the first step is getting started, showcasing some value, getting some buy-in, so then you can start about what's the frame? What tools are we going to be using to guide us, right? It could be principles, it can be the value, and then what do you do with those values? You turn them to process, and you turn them to metrics, right? So I can have some high-level principles, but I don't have any enforcement, right? So it's still a governance that lacks value, lacks tangibility. And the most mature that we see right now uh, in the field I usually, I like to call this trimming. I was trying to have all of them in ING, so bear with me. Um, you have the governance framework, but it's not really tested, right? You have the house, it's there, it's pretty complete, but there's no furniture, and you're not sure it looks at the way you'd like to be looking, right? So, uh, and you don't have the right tool either, right? So this talks about time intensiveness, for example. Um, show of hands, who falls in which category? Who falls in the grounding? Category, stage one, just think about governance. Okay, awesome, thank you for, you know, it takes a lot to say that, thank you. Um, who falls into framing? Okay, okay, good. And what about trimming? Who are the most mature clients here, much mature users? Nobody? Okay, oh, okay, awesome. Um, okay, so, that was the kind of first, the end of the first section. We've seen that we have this big tension talking about scale and agility and control. We have theories, we have concepts, we have common problems, we have different maturities. Um, and these are great lenses to think about this, but it's not enough, right? And what I would like to do with you today is really help you to find the right approach to get started. Um, and I think to help you find the right approach, we have to start with a story. Uh, let's start with a company uh, that is called Acme, and they are a luxury brand, and they're trying, they've been using Dataku for two years when they started with their first AI strategy. Um, they're all about enriching customer experience. They've been um, working with uh, dummy use cases, and now they're really ready to scale to other teams and really to push and innovate and scale those revenues, right? They're working across geographies between the US and France. And if we dive a little deeper within this company, we see that we have Marsha. She's an analytics leader. She's been in charge of um, the data science team. And she's looking to, she's really the driver behind the strategy, right? She is here to scale impact, she is focusing on the production pipeline, and she also knows that risks are there. She needs to focus on them, but it's not really the priority. 
Uh, and then we have Alex. Alex has been working at this company for a while. He has seen governance evolve from traditional corporate governance to data governance, and he doesn't really understand what's the fuss about the models and AI, right? And for him, he's looking to think about, okay, we have all those projects, let's look at risk now, right? What does risk, risk looks right now? And how can we start having some mitigation techniques to really prepare ourselves if we have a regulator coming, right? Okay, so if we start with Alex, Alex represents what I call the control and risk approach. Alex represents many roles those are personas, it might be called, it might have a different title within the organization, but they all say the same thing, which is we need more roles, we need more visibility to protect the business, right? It's all about understanding what's going on, finding the value, and being ready, you know? Uh, what they're focusing on and what they're optimizing for are two things, auditability and risk and control, right? They're not really caring so much about efficiency, time to value, scalability. What's great is that they're gonna be putting those roles, those rules, sorry, in place, but if they go too far, they're gonna be forgetting about the impact of the value, right? Too much control might be preventing and slowing the impact and value. I think this is the, also the main fear for Marsha, because Marsha comes from the impact and agility approach. Marsha's role and job is to make things efficient. She's trying to have some impact, she's trying to have some agility, and she doesn't wanna be slowed down by anybody. She got, she's busy, she has stuff to do, right? And she represents so many core data queue users. They're trying to address an issue with data, who wants to deploy faster to make their project profitable, successful, and want to have insights, right? And you can understand here the logic, which is if you have only agility and not enough rules, then you might have all this scaling and all those issues I was mentioning at the beginning, which is lack of efficiency, opacity, and the different risk, right? So we have those two approaches, and it's great, but what else do you do? So let's look again at Ackman. What does it look like? So for them, it happens that Marsha has a bigger presence and a bigger leadership buy-in than Alex, and what's happening is that Marsha's goals and, Marcia and Alex's goal are having some friction. Right? So Marsha is focusing on the production pipeline, she's focusing on the practices of data science, and Alex is thinking about, I need a framework, I need values, right? So they're kind of thinking, oh, we're not really seeing eye to eye, right? Alex is thinking about use case compliance because the regulator is saying any HR use case will be regulated, right? Marsha is thinking about where's my model drift, where's my data drift, how can I know how to retrain my models, right? Um, and we see that this power imbalance is not really helping with the core challenges, right? AI is still difficult to search, difficult to find, difficult to explore. It's still undocumented and it creates more cost and more risk, right? What I'm trying to tell you here is that potentially within the organization, the way you might be missing an opportunity be your biggest to lie. What I'm trying to tell you here is that maybe Marsha and Alex can be working together and really helping each other, right? Um, what we see with a lot of companies that we're working with is that, oh, is that there's friction, right? There's friction within the business AI role and the governance role, right? The business AI role are not always inviting the governance and control role, right? Um, and the question is, how do we move past this, right? Because if you want to be successful, we're all part of the same organization, same team. We have to move forward together. Um, and this is a very dead answer, but the answer is collaboration and compromise, right? So it's all about finding balance, and balance will be happening through collaboration, right? So um, actually, maybe Marsha and Alex have something to, know, to, to learn from each other. Marsha might be learning from more structure, from more controls, and maybe Alex might be knowing about more team agility, right? There is this thin balance that needs to happen between control and agility, and this is what needs to happen when you think about oversight and, and agility. What I'm trying to tell you is that governance and scale are not mutually exclusive. They can coexist together and really reinforce each other, right? And this is, I think, the gist of thinking about governance for AI scaling. Um, so we've seen 
the issue. We have now a couple of ideas about how to do this best. Let's dive into the product to really think about what DataIQ is providing you today and how is that going to be evolving uh, in the future. OK, so um, before I do that, you already know I like my stories. So we have to go back to Acme and kind of get thinking about what is happening. Well, they're still trying to figure out how to work together, and they still have governance challenges. They have those objectives, but they don't really know if they are aligned, and they have those pains that are painful, right? So it's a pain, and how do we move past this? Um, well, I'm going to provide you with three steps, and those three steps are embedded within our platform within our product. The first step, each step is relating to best practice that I was sharing earlier. The first step is centralize and prioritize, right? The first step is have the oversight that you're missing. Make sure that you can have everything in one central place. The second step is once that I have everything centralized, I want to explain, I want to qualify. I want to make sure everything that needs to be documented is documented so I know and I'm in control of anything that's going to be deployed and monitored in the third step, right? Okay. So um, story time again, different metaphor, planes, airport. Um, when we think about an airport, we usually are missing the core foundational infrastructure of an airport, which is a tower of control. How do we make sure that there is thousands of planes that are leaving and landing and everybody's safe? It seems kind of normal nowadays to just get on a plane and just move on, right? Um, but the point of a tower of control is making sure that they have the big picture, they understand what is going on, and it's the same with AI. You need a big picture. You need to understand what is going on, especially as you're trying to scale. Um, and this is what we provide with that IQ Govern. We're going to be helping you with tracking AI progress in one centralized place. What's amazing with this is that because we're one unique platform, it takes everything that you have within your design node and bring it to one place when you can decide what to govern and what not to govern, right? So you're, you're gaining a lot of time here, right? Because you can say, okay, all of those projects are R&D projects and I don't need to be governing them, but these projects are going to go to production in a month, right? So I need to start thinking about how I'm going to be governing them, right? Um, Let's have a look about how that works in practice. OK. So this is that IQ govern, and you have those four items. What I was talking about is called governable items. And you can see here you have a list of all the items that are automatically imported from that IQ. And I can use those filters to say I want to look only at projects, and I want to look only at items that mean something to me. So I can, like in my inbox, select this, OK, I want to keep this, I want to leave, this, I want to keep, this, I want to leave, right? This is a way you can hide artifact or make them visible depending on what is relevant for you so that you're not drowned into too much information, too many choices to make. We also have the search bar. And for example, here, if we think about Acme, they're going to be looking for a market analysis project, right? And they're going to be governing it. OK. So this is awesome. We have now this tower of control. We have this big picture. We can say, OK, I'm going to prioritize this market analysis project. Let's go. OK, what else? We need to know more than if the plane is coming, if it's working. We need to know what is in the plane, what airline is it flying on, and what is going to be the second step is all about explaining, qualifying. Inside the tower of control, there are agents that are making sure that they can target what is the plane with the biggest risk to make sure there's no delays, to make sure there's no collisions, right? It's the same thing with all your models and all your projects. You want to make sure nothing is going to be late. You're going to make sure nothing is going to break. So those two core features are what I call workflows. Those are standardized ways to make sure that you can define scope 
you can define sponsorship, you can prepare for your audit, right? And you can also make sure that all the projects are going through the same exact steps. What we see with a lot of clients is that some, one project is built like this, one project is built like that, and we need more standards, we need more um, workflows. Once that you describe your project with a workflow, you're gonna be able to qualify it, right? You can now say, okay, my project looks like this, it looks like that, but what else? I need to know what is the value of the project, what is the risk of the project, right? And this is good not only for the data scientists thinking about the project pipeline, but also when you're reporting to your internal stakeholders, right? If you're able to say to your stakeholders, I have 90 projects, 60 of them are going to production, here's the value, risk, ratio, this is how well we're doing, right? And now you can scale, and now you have this tool to scale. Okay, so let's have a look at how they work in practice. Okay, so I was telling you about business initiatives. Business initiative are a new type of object that we introduced with Govern to make sure that you can have, you can navigate uh, your projects better. This is a way for you to, when you're gonna be governing a project, you can tie it to a business initiative so you can retrieve all the projects that belong to one initiative. So here we are in the market analysis project and we're doing the description. We're filling in what is the business initiative, who is gonna be the sponsor, and what's really cool about this is like when you click on the sponsor, like Sean Conley here, you'll be able to see who, uh, how many projects is he sponsoring. So now you can look at the project type and scope. This project is gonna be deployed in France, it's gonna be deployed in Denmark. Okay, I'm a little early. Um, and then you can also add some different type of business functions, right? What I love about this is that down the line, you can reuse those filters to navigate through projects. Down the line, you'll be able to say, let me have a look at all the projects deployed in France. Let me have a look at all the projects for HR or for cybersecurity, right? And you can now understand all the time gain you can get and make sure things are efficient and they're rolling. Something important here is that you'll be deciding what are the reviewers and people are gonna be validating, giving you feedback and validating your models directly at the project level, which makes sense, right? As you start your projects, you know exactly who Dandelion is gonna say go or no go, right? So now we're not in the overview anymore, we are in the workflow. And this is the qualification I was telling you about. This is a way for you to, once that you've said this is what the project is gonna look like, this is the idea of the project, now we can say, okay, let's qualify it. So you can put some notes, um, and we have this very easy uh, and simple uh, low to high scale to assess risk, to assess value, and to assess feasibility. So what's great about this is that it provides flexibility. If today you have a complex framework, you can say, I'm ranking this on high value because of this framework. If you don't have a framework, this is an opportunity for you to think about it and still work out how you wanna be justifying, commenting, in building this audit trail that then will be reviewed by the line by someone else, right? So now we have those two steps and we've seen that we're making progress on the workflow and we know what stage is the project at. This is the risk value matrix that I was telling you. This is kind of the centralized place for projects and you can, at the top, you see all of the filters I was mentioning you. Okay, so we've seen the need for a tower of control, we've seen who is in tower of control, what are they doing? Now all the, place, all the plane are on the tarmac, they're ready to take off, let's go. Okay, so before your planes, before your model, before your project are gonna, gonna leave the tarmac, you need to make sure they've been reviewed, they've been approved, right? You need to make sure that you have the right rules so you make sure that you're gonna have the right projects and right models inside of production, right? I was um, anecdote from a client that was tired of chasing after data scientists that were trying to send things to production without aligned with internal policy. This is a good way for you to make sure this doesn't happen, right? The second thing that is important here in terms of feature that we provide is the centralized model registry. It provides you with a centralized place to have all your models, see the ones that are being sent to production, and be able to monitor all the metrics. So we're talking about data drift, we're talking about model drift, as well as all the other standard monitoring features. 
So let's think again about Alex and Marsha. Alex and Marsha need to make sure everything that is deployed is going to be uh, uh, validated before. So you see that here, this is an example of we're going to try to deploy it. Ooh, it's not working. This is an invalid governance procedure. So it means that you need to go back on govern and have some validation, right? So we're going to be requesting a review, and we're going to be asking the business risk and compliance and IT and operations their feedback. And they're going to receive an email saying, hey, I need you to provide me some feedback on this, right? So they, here's a, how the feedback process worked. I'm going to be saying, this is approved to me. This is good to go. Perfect, right? So I submit the review, and then I can ask for the final approval, right? This is modular and flexible. It doesn't have to mean that you have to, you're stuck before everybody has given you the feedback, right? So you can request for the approval. Yes. And then the final approval is important because there's only one person that can say it's a go or no go. You'll never be stuck because you have another stakeholder that said no. And this is a very important one, be able to override uh, the feedback for someone else. Um, and again, you have the ability to provide a comment. This is a great way to make things auditable because if a model was um, prevented from going to production, it's important to know why, right? Okay, so now you see that I come back to uh, my market analysis project, I come back to my model version, I'm trying to send it to production, and let's see if it's gonna work. Ooh. And it's working, okay. Sorry, that was the video. So, um, okay. So let's have a look at the model registry now. So the model registry centralized everything. As you can see, you have, again, at the top some filters. So you can look at what is governed, what is not governed. If you want to uh, filter through metrics, this is possible. And you can look at your model and then your model version. And you can see that you have all the model versions together. You can see that you can look at the active version. So it's easier, and then you have all those insights here on uh, the right that are showing up to make this as easy to navigate as possible. Okay, so I see time running out. Um, those were the three steps, right? We've seen how we can centralize and prioritize through this control tower. We can explain and qualify. We can deploy monitor. And we have dedicated features that address each and every one of those steps. One I want to leave you this here uh, with here is that those features are not coming out of nowhere. That IQ has been around for a couple of years now, and we came up with Govern because we've been working on governance for a while. And we have had governance feature embedded in all the nodes uh, since the beginning, and this only completes the story to make us this unique platform. So if we take this away um, for a little bit, um, and we think again about Acme, uh, we now know that they know how to search and find and explore AI, we know how to qualify and analyze, and we know how to get the control and oversight that we need, right? The objectives are now aligned and they have the relief to their issues. If I'm gonna wrap up um, this talk, I wanna leave you with a couple of ideas and then I'll be more than happy to take some questions. The first one is, it's all about collaboration. That IQ with the flow, I've been building and thinking about collaboration for a while. This is what we're doing with Govern. We want to make sure that the leaders, the builders, the experts, and the operational expert are all talking together on one platform, and everybody's finding the right information about the right time, and really make sure we can all work together and be successful together, right? So all those features talk to that and talk to the wider platform and all of the features that we had, uh, you can see here, for example, um, the um, automated documentation generator, which is one of my favorite features about governance. Um, so we have this entire um, vision to leave you with and something that some of you might be really excited about with, govern, with DataQ 11 and Govern, we'll have the bundle registry. So similarly to the model registry that talks about models, we have bundles. So, uh, so bundles are, if you don't know, project snapshots. They're almost like project versions. So you can make sure that you have the same type of control on your models as well as on your project. So you have really this balance between analytics and AI, right? The point is that those two go together. Um, 
something I want to leave you with is that um, we're not perfect either, right? Our house, our product, Govern is just it's in infancy. This is the beginning for us. And we are looking to make sure our house is trimmed too and looks stellar. Um, so we need your feedback. And I was saying this earlier. I'm doing this presentation thanks to you all that are spending time and energy with us. And I would be more than happy to receive the feedback and your stories to make this even more powerful and even more useful for you. Um, so if you have any questions, now is the time. If you want to explore more, now is the time. I'm, if we don't have time to do all the questions, I'm going to be around today. I'll be at the cocktail hour. I'll be at the demo station. If you haven't seen the demo station, it's absolutely um, great. So uh, come say hi. Um, I know we don't have um, a mic around. So if you want to start sharing your questions, you have to shout a little bit for me, OK? Awesome. Do we already have questions in the audience? If it's all clear, that's amazing too. OK. Yes. Yeah, that's, that, that's it. That, it's down the road. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, this is, um, we understand that Dataiku is sometimes one more tool within a very expensive and growing tech stack. And we want to make sure that this all blends together and works well together. So we have within our roadmap integrations. And this is great for you to share this with me because this is something that I like to take to the product team to make sure that we know there's a high demand for Jira. For Jira integration, we can prioritize this within the roadmap. Um, we've been working with a lot of clients that are using Jira, but Jira is very useful for certain use cases, but not for everything, right? So as we're all trying to figure out what governance means for us and how we can leverage the tools that we need, it's important to kind of you know, take what you can from Jira, take what you can from Dataiku, and also talk with us so we can make sure that we can provide you with all the support and services that you need. Okay, for sure, for sure, yes. Yes, please. Yeah. So it's a great question, right? So I, if you remember when I was talking about the different type of governance maturities, usually people start by thinking data governance, right? Govern is not a data governance tool. We have some data cataloging capabilities. We have brilliant integration and partnership with Elation and Calibra. And these are great. And Govern really focuses on the projects, on the models. We do have some. Uh, it reflects some metadata from the design node and the different type of plugins. So if you're using sensitive data or the different data cataloging uh, work that you've been doing, but it doesn't necessarily try to replace, you know, that. Yes. Yeah, so is, I, if I rephrase your question, you're, you have a bunch of data within your Excel and you want to govern this data, right? So I think this would be more coming back to the previous question, a data governance question. And within DataIQ, you have a cataloging, cataloging capability and some integration with Elation um, and Calibra that will help you do this data governance part. Uh, again, govern is really very much about doing some model governance, doing some project governance, and very much about the analytics projects. The data is absolutely essential. Don't get me wrong. It's just that 
we know that some solutions out there are doing a fantastic job, and we try to address needs that are unmet on the market. Oh, no, 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 for sure. Yeah, yeah, you can. Story, yeah. Okay, so you're asking me all tricky questions with integrations today. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so please correct me, but what I, the way I understand your question is that you have your MLOP process and Govern is one piece of this MLOPS process, right? So if you're talking only within Dataiku, Govern is only one new node, it's only one new environment. You're still on the same platform. Right? So as you have your design node, you have your automation node, you have your API node, this is a new node that you can you know, go to within your little menu with all the little squares. Um, and so you can keep everything within one, right? We still have one platform. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So for sure. So indeed, we don't think this is a magic wand. Uh, we understand that there are some specificities that come within your organization that are specific to your team, that are specific to your industry, that are specific to your uh, geo, and indeed part of, I'm, I, I introduce myself as the AI governance consultant, that's my job to kind of understand and help you figure out how to best use uh, this. And indeed it's difficult to, to provide you with an answer because I would need to know a little bit more. Um, but thank you, I appreciate it. Yes. So it's a great question. Once, you, once you're gonna be setting your, and activating your govern node, you're gonna be deciding, making some decisions. Do I want all my models and projects to be um, governed before they're being sent to production? And also you're gonna be onboarding all your different users. You might not be wanting all your users to have the same roles and permission, right? So you are able within govern to select the level of granularity. Do I want this type of profiles to be able to see this and have this actions, right? So you, you are able to have you know, to set this up to make sure that um, you can implement your own way of doing governance. Yeah, awesome. Yes? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we provide those four core features, but you don't have to use all of them, right? It also depends on like your maturity. It might be overwhelming at first to be, you know, trying to, centralize all your projects, do your sign off, do your uh, uh, model registry at the same time, so you can use whatever you need whenever you need it, you know? That's the, that's the gist of the idea. Um, okay, if we don't have any more questions, I think we're gonna wrap up. Uh, can I have a last roll of hands? Did you think the presentation was good? Did you learn something new today? Yay, awesome, okay, thank you so much.